Welcome to the RX2 Fitness Podcast, Mr. John Clark. How are you today and how is lockdown? Uh, I'm good, thank you very much. Uh, firstly, thank you for inviting me. Very honoured to be one of the first uh, guests on the podcast. Um, yeah, no, I'm okay. I'm um, adjusting to our new normal, as we've all kind of taken to calling it, and figuring out what life looks like now and then for the foreseeable where, where we can with training, business, life, and, and everything else in between. Yeah, I think, I think it, as you say, it's the foreseeable future, making the most of it, and um, yeah, just making sure we're okay, and that is that. I think that's the thing, isn't it? A lot of us thought that this was just going to be a couple of weeks thing, and it's just yeah. like the normal flu, and I don't think any of us really appreciated. I think when you look back at some of the stuff a lot of people were posting and talking about and sharing, even two months ago, I don't think you'd have ever foreseen that we'd end up being here with this death toll, this impact, this amount of restriction. So, yeah, it's all very, it's all happened very quickly and all kind of been left field. But I think for many, myself included, it's shown us what is important to us, what matters to us, yeah. um, and definitely strengthened a lot of relationships that maybe you didn't realise were there to begin with. So, so yeah, I think it's been a, a massive tool for learning as well as everything else. Yeah, it's it's funny you were saying that um, on how how long it's been on for because you know I took a dog for a walk yesterday, and I was thinking you know this is week four on lockdown, and then before the four weeks, as you said, there was a build up and everybody talking about you know it's just the flu, it's okay, we can still do all these things. Yeah. And now, I mean, this morning I was looking at the update, and they were looking at the whole curve and how it's improving now, so things are working and. Yeah, but it's like you said, it just kind of pulls things into perspective and, you know, it's, it's making people a bit more aware and a bit more like what we prioritize. I mean, I know, fine, I'm texting people and FaceTiming people more frequent and thinking about the bigger picture as opposed to just kind of driving on each day with like kind of work and training or whatever, you know? Yeah, it's definitely made me reflect on things that, maybe I thought I wanted, but maybe I actually don't. Things that you kind of prioritize and wish you had more time to do, and then you have the time to do it, and you're like, actually, I don't even like doing this. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, been, it's been a fascinating time, aside from obviously the, well, it's hard to talk about something that's so prevalent at the, prevalent at the minute, because obviously we, talk, we, we are talking about people that are dying, people yeah. that are terminally ill. Yeah. But it's been, obviously the positives, are that it's forced us to now reflect, forced us to think, forced us to review what we're doing and why we do it. And I, gen I said this at the beginning when lockdown was first announced, when Boris first grounded us all, that I think we genuinely will come out the other end, better society for it, a better, better as individuals, better as friends, better family members. I'm a much better son than I was pre-lockdown, actually find the time to ring my mother now rather than just putting it off and there's lots of little things like that that it's definitely reminded us that actually for many of us that have big goals or aspirations or career goals financial housing whatever it might be that actually the life that we live at the minute ain't all as bad as we as we maybe sometimes like to think so now i think aside from obviously all the the negatives from it i think that we will come out better the other side of it as a result yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think the important thing as well is, you know, we retain, you know, all the positives that people are building up, you know, in their day to day, you know. I mean, the walk that I always go on, uh, that I take Ralph, uh, the dog, not a human, uh, for a walk every single day. <laughs> and you normally see one, two, at a push, three people. And yesterday, it's, it's almost like a public park, you know, and people can maybe complain about secluded areas be more populated now or their secret areas more populated, but it's good. You know, people are getting around seven hours of exercise a week. How is that a bad thing? If they went from nothing to that, and if, if they only build on that, then, and they retain it and build on it, then. I, th I think it's been, it's been massively influential in terms of showing people the importance of having an hour a day for themselves. 
obviously oh, the you know, forest allowing everyone to go outside still to walk to run or to exercise in general i think it's massively highlighted to people there's a great meme i saw or meme however you want to say it <laughs> i can never decide which side of the coin i sit on with that but anyway and um it was pre-coronavirus and it's all this family sat around on their phone and it's post-coronavirus with that family now outside walking and I think if there's ever, ever anything that it would take to highlight to a nation the importance of being fit, healthy, active, spending an hour doing something for yourself, mm. then I'm hoping that this will obviously spur a lot of people to create good habits. And I know a lot of people are complaining about the length of the lockdown and they're going stir crazy. But as you and I know, habits take time. And the fact that we will have probably have had six or seven weeks of only being allowed outdoors to exercise or to buy food shopping hopefully it will actually ingrain the habit that that hour a day on your own health fitness wellness whether it's psychological health physical health mental health whatever that is should hopefully then stay as a habit for many of the country um because i I, well it's definitely needed yeah uh, i guess time will tell yeah i mean one of the things i think people have also been somewhat surprised by is how much they can achieve within the lockdown. You know, Uh, I was actually speaking to my client group uh, this morning, you know, on how things have been over the course of the four weeks and, and, and if they've been, you know, happy with the support that they've gotten from me and, and how things are with them. And a couple of them I recognized were massively struggling, struggling uh, psychologically and, instead of just kind of being, you know, somewhat, oh, oh, just get on with it, blah, blah, blah. Like I would never do that anyway. Um, I recognized it and I had to support those people, even if it was by a specific comment or a message, a private message, or in video feedback, say, you know, say things in a certain way. And this was highlighted in the feedback where they said, you know, I was initially really, really struggling. However, over the course of, you know, the time, um, I, I took certain pieces of information of the comments, et cetera, from you. And I've built on it and I'm now really, really enjoying, you know, my home-based workouts and, you know, my dietary structure and stuff like that now. And, and I think, you know, as you said, initially people maybe panic and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden because of they're now used to the changes, they're almost welcoming the changes a wee bit and, and just, you know, reminding themselves that the lockdown isn't going to be for three, four weeks. Prepare yeah. for much longer. And how do you get the best of it? If I think that's one of the things that we've been, I've certainly been reminding our team of coaches of is that, because there's an element of, oh, we're putting out this content, we're putting out this content, but not everyone's engaging in it. Not all the members are doing anything. Only 25% of the members are getting involved in home workouts. And, and it's just remembering that to us, fitness is our life. It's, yeah. it's our career. It's what we do. It's what we think about. If we've got a spare hour, it's normally how can I fit an extra arm session in or how can I go for another run? <laughs> but to the majority of the general public, it's very low on the priority list. And it's something that is done at the end of the day if they've got time, effort and energy. So with the amount of change they've been bombarded with in lifestyle, financial situation, employment status, so on and so forth, they've, they've got to figure all that stuff out first before they even think about, right, how can I find a, something in my house that mimics the resistance of a kettlebell? Yeah. Um, and I think that that's one of the, the challenges for the fitness industry has been over this period is that there's you always get black and white you always get one that is like you should be hashtag beast mode still going strong it's not an excuse to be shit i'm sorry am i allowed to swear before i go go for it man go for it um and then you got the other group that's like don't worry about it take some time off do what you want and then you got the normal people that sit in the middle that actually there isn't a right or a wrong way it's finding the way that suits you and how where you're at with it and, um, and I think that that's where a lot of people have then felt either guilt because they're not doing enough or they've felt um, like they're making other people feel bad because they're doing a lot. And it's just that reminder to everybody that the, for me, the goal hasn't changed whether we're in lockdown or not. The goal is to find your version of fitness, your level of activity that you're comfortable with, that you're happy with, that you enjoy. And right now, if you're in lockdown but can't get motivated to get off the sofa other than to go to the fridge, then that's not a bad thing and you shouldn't feel bad for that. But you should only feel bad for it if that's not really what you want to be doing. 
if that makes any kind of sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's... Um, anyways, we could speak about lockdown for... God, all day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, as much as I'm enjoying this part of it, um, the main reason that basically you're on is to... Well, I personally find that you've had quite quite an inspirational and quite an amazing um, athletic, you know, background and career, and it's ongoing. And uh, basically, I wanted to invite you on just to kind of go over that, you know, what, you know, what encouraged you and motivated you to go into certain areas, um, you know, what struggles did you have, what successes did you have? And what people can really learn from it, to be honest, and uh, because, like I said, I've got a snapshot of what you've done and what you're doing. And personally, you know, you certainly put the fire up me, that's for sure. And um, but I, as as you mentioned before, you know, as a fitness professional, it's easy. These things can come easier to you than it would do to somebody who's not. But I feel like there would be a lot of messages in here and takeaways for anybody who would be listening to definitely help them, you know, whether it's a mindset thing or whether it's a habit thing or whether it's just like something that it's always been in the back of their mind and they've just never felt like they could really push themselves to go and do it because as people are going to hear, you've done completely different things and you're continuing to do it. So it's not like the dots are joining in any way, shape or form. Yeah. But I mean, um, so, I mean, with that, I kind of want to start to start. Now, to my knowledge of that, um, you started off playing rugby um, at a fairly decent level, if I'm right. Yeah. Was, well, yeah, if we go way back when to the beginning, <laughs> it was, um, yeah, so my first kind of decent exposure to like good level sport, I guess, was rugby. Um, played in the Premier Leagues at university with Worcester University or University of Worcester. Um, so that was like the highest level you can play at in the university uh, league system at the time. And then from there, ended up then playing in the National Leagues with Malvern Rugby Club. So we played with them for three or four years until I broke my neck. Um, so that was kind of my first adventure into decent level sport. Um, and then kind of everything snowballed from there. But a lot of the stuff that I've done post rugby was founded upon lessons and things that I learned from doing rugby. Um, and I, you said some very kind things there about me. So firstly, thank you for that <laughs> as well. But one of the things that I, some of our members, for example, look up to some of the stuff that I do and have done and I'm doing at the minute and, and look at it as, maybe something that's inspirational aspirational or something that motivates them to maybe do something similar um and the message that i tell everybody if if anyone is inspired by anything that i've achieved or done it's not that i'm any different to anybody like, i'm not genetically gifted in any sense in anything like i'm ginger i burn in the sun very easily <laughs> i'm not naturally skinny or lean um i'm probably genetically strong um but that's by the by um, but a lot of the stuff that I've done in sport, in ski erg world records and all that kind of stuff is just based upon my own stubbornness, bloody mindedness and ability to back myself to have a go. And I think that that's something that we all have within us. We just need to light that fire or take that leap of faith to do it. Um, but yeah, so I mean, back to the, the beginning, so to speak, a lot of the stuff that I think now, a lot of the foundations of my thought process were founded in rugby. And that's why I recommend to so many people that to try team sports or any sport or com competitive sport from an early age. Because in rugby, when you're on your own try line, two minutes to go, defending the line, not just for you, but for your 14 other mates, the guys on the bench, your coaches, the people on the sideline that have paid money to watch you, and cheering you on that presents a very different type of motivation and if you can find that motivation to do that amount of work when you're absolutely bollocks and haven't got another tackle in you to get back up go again go one more that will transcend every other sporting pursuit that you have 
moving forward. And I think that that's why team sport is so incredible because it's not about you. It's never about you. It's about the team. It's about the why, the purpose, and, and why you're all on that field together. Um, but yeah, I guess for me, it started with rugby and then it's kind of snowballed from there. But my hopping around of sports have all been from injuries outside of my control. Um, again, so it's not a lot of my journey that I guess we'll speak about today has not been one out of design, but one out of circumstance as well. Yeah, well, you use the word injury extremely casual, especially when you're talking about a broken neck, that's for sure. But it, then, it, sounds, uh... it sounds worse than it is. So, <laughs> um, a scrum collapsed. Uh, my forehead touched my chest as the weight of the scrum went through through my neck. Heard and felt two cracks happen in my, in my neck and then eventually transpired that there were two hairline fractures uh, in the neck. So a broken neck is... I suppose what you can call it, but I wasn't in a wheelchair. I wasn't in a neck brace or needing surgery. There's far more uh, higher profile ways to break a neck than than mine, which would just rest and don't play rugby for a year. Um, But yeah, I mean, that was a significant one for me because it was the first time it showed me that you aren't indestructible and that bad things can happen. Um, But I mean, I was 25, 26 at the time. So at that point, I'd not really had that many serious injuries. I say not many serious injuries, like knee reconstructions, clean outs, shoulder dislocations and all of that. But that is just standard rugby stuff in the front row for most. (laughs) But but that was the first one that made me realise that actually our time in sport or competitive, in in, in any competitive environment, the, the time that we have to test our bodies and to see what we're capable of is limited. And that's one of the things that's always driven me now in, in anything that I do is like, oh well, yeah, I could do it or I could not, but I wouldn't want to look back in 10 years time when my knees have missed the ability to be able to do an Ironman uh, and then think, oh, well, I wish I'd done it 10 years ago before I'd had to have a knee replacement or my knees had given up or my back had gone or so on and so forth. So it's things like that. It's learning lessons from things like injuries that have then spurred me on moving forward in terms of making the most out of the situation that I find myself in. Yeah, I mean, talking talking from my own personal experience as well, I couldn't I couldn't agree more with that. I remember I remember when Lane Norton uh, came over to Scotland and he did some workshops, and uh, he was basically the person that I I learned how to do the big three lifts from, and he actually spoke about it, and he he's obviously had his own injuries as well, and uh, but he says you know if you're not getting injured, then you're not pushing yourself to find your potential. And I didn't think about it that way, but then in hindsight, I would, I would 100% agree because you know yourself, there's so many people that really, really hold themselves back, you know, especially when it comes to competition or even if it's just training in the gym, you know, to, to be the best it can be, as cheesy as that might sound. But, um, you know, sometimes you'll see this with clients. Some clients may... Push, try and push themselves too far, but then you'll see you'll see the potential in other ones, and they'll only go there if you give them the green light to, or you encourage them to, and then all of a sudden they realize what they can't do, and they they just think, oh, I can't believe it, and it's like, yeah, it's, but then in the back of their mind they think, well, I I, I kind of feel like every t- every time if I go for this, I may injure myself or hurt myself, and. I suppose that's always going to be in the back of your mind, but it's always going to be in the cards as well. But then an injury doesn't mean knee reconstruction, you know, it's, uh, yeah. And it's, it's funny. The reason I just grabbed my phone was my, uh, my wallpaper on my phone is only those who are risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. Um, I'm a fan of quotes. I often get the piss ripped out of me for it, but <laughs> I think that's a similar sentiment that it's not talking about going to that red line all the time. You've got to train smart. You've got to be sensible. Yeah. But in terms of choosing a goal and going, actually, do you know what? I'm going to go for that. You have to go all in to do it for the most part, especially the stuff that I end up choosing to do as, as my next pursuits and everything else. But oh, it's this idea that a lot of us, we need external um, that external green light, someone else to tell us it's possible, someone else to say you can do it before you then trust yourself to try it. Um, 
And I guess that that's one of the most limiting factors for many is that then they're relying on somebody else sharing the vision that they believe that that's possible. And you know what it's like as a personal trainer, as a coach, you'll look at people's lifting and you'll go, yeah, you've got that. You haven't, you can give them the green light. But some of the stuff that many of us wish we had the balls to try or wish we had the courage to do, that's not going to be a shared vision with other people. They'll look at it and go, no, that is stupid. You shouldn't do that. But actually, if they give themselves the green light and they give themselves the authority to pursue it, then they can do it. Um, and I guess that's the difference between internal and external gratification and, and, um, and approval from people. That it's too often we look for other people to determine what we're capable of doing. And like we said before we, we went online, so to speak, is the idea of potential really winds me up. Who, who are you to tell me what my potential is? Who are you to tell me how hard I can work, how hard I can push, how well I can perform? That's up to me to decide. And I think that that's where a lot of people struggle is that they get stuck with this idea of there being a glass ceiling, this idea of there being a potential limit of how far they can run. If you'd have told me as a 185 kilo strongman that in, in three years post retiring from strongman, you'd be running in a, a triathlon training for an Ironman. I don't think anyone would have believed you. My, a lot of my peers who I used to compete with who are still strength, strength, strength athletes now, they messaged me yesterday being like, what are you doing? Like, how is that even possible? But again, if I'd have said to somebody at 185 kilos, you know what, I'm going to run an Ironman. I don't think I'd have found anyone that would have said, yeah, you could do that. So if I was waiting for an external green light to try it, I'd still be 180 kilos without having strongman in my life, just being that heavy without a sport to train for. Yeah. Um, so I guess my point that I'm trying to make is so many of us look for external clarification and external approval before we commit to doing something that we really wish we want to try and don't always just rely on that because for the most part, if it's stupid enough and audacious enough, you won't find anyone that agrees that it's a good idea anyway. <laughs> And you can only test the water as well, you know. You can dip your toe in the water and just say, "Oh, you know what? I, I quite, I think um, I've got the potential for this, or I quite like it." You know, let's see where it goes. And did you say well, that, you can... that's exactly it? And that's where strongman came in from for me. So I'd had to obviously stop playing rugby for a year. I was just thought, well, I'm just going to train in the gym, do the whole like get rigged up, get jacked, but no tan because I'm ginger and don't get a tan. But, um, and I was just training in the gym, training next to a guy called Rich Senewald, who I believe you, you'll be aware of and know as well. And he was like, oh, you're pretty strong. What, what do you do? I was like, oh, nothing. Um, <laughs> just lift. And uh, anyway, he invited me to train with him, ended up training some strongman stuff with him. He invited me to then go down and train with Lauren Charley, who at the time was uh, one of the world's strongest men competitors, uh, Britain's strongest man, so on and so forth. Um, and again, it wasn't until I met Loz that he gave me the kind of like the external approval that I could possibly be decent or be okay at Strongman. But that was the first time that it kind of dawned on me that why have I waited for somebody else to tell me, oh, actually, you could have a go, you could be decent at this, yeah. when I could have just signed up to a competition and done it anyway. I didn't have to wait for somebody else to give me that approval to do it. Um, but in, until you try it, you're never going to know anyway. Um, he saw some potential in me, although I say I hate the word potential, but saw some ability in me. Um, and then that kind of gave me the push to finally actually compete and do it. And then a year later, I'd won Britain's natural strongest man. And the year after that, I'd won Midland's strongest man. So like, it takes trying it to, to realize your ability a lot of the time as well. Yeah. Um, but so often we get stuck in this idea of, well, the end goal is so, so far away. I couldn't possibly ever get to that point. And we just need to focus on, well, it's, again, when people ask me, like, what's, the, what's the top tip you can give me? I've got a load of weight to lose. You've lost 70 kilos. How did you do it? I lost one kilo at a time. If you'd have asked me at 185 if I wanted to weigh 110, yeah, absolutely. But if I'd have just focused on that, I wouldn't have lost 75 kilos. You just lose one kilo at a time. And it's the same way whether you're training for strength, whether you're training for an Ironman, whether you're training for a skier, whatever it is, you just got to do that one building block at a time and focus on doing that as best as you can to your best of your ability in that moment in time, um, rather than getting stuck in this headspace of, oh, well, world's strongest man is over there. I could never get to there. Or, or an Ironman is that far. I can't even run 5K at the minute. How, how am I going to run an Ironman? Um, 
but if you just if you allow the end goal to demotivate you you'll never you'll never get to the end goal anyway um but yeah i think that that's one of the things that trying it and just having a go is the most undervalued part of most people's ability to take a new goal by the scruff of the neck and actually put themselves in the deep end to try it yeah yeah i want to come back slightly to what you were saying there about how people can just instantly demotivate themselves by viewing you know the outcome goal and not realizing there's a process goal you know a process based goal and you see it so often and i think this is why so many people end up constantly going through these quick fixes you know whether it's through nutrition whether it's through training you know constantly downloading cookie cutters or you know falling for the next fad diet or whatever because they only view this outcome but they don't visualize or they don't even attempt to visualize what an outcome you know could potentially be so because they become more and more desperate to to achieve something that they don't even know that they actually want to achieve but they just know that whatever they're doing right now is something that they don't want to do or be in that they just keep going through this again this negative process as opposed to just saying you know what let's put down a marker here see if it works does it work yes how did it work what could I change? Okay, let's go to the next marker again. Did it work? Yes. How did it work? How do we need to adjust anything? And I suppose this all also comes down to like a patience thing where people just don't want to want to be patient and develop the process, you know? The, what it comes down to for me in, in any sport I've done, any, Stupid stupidity I've managed to get myself involved in is finding the joy in the work. Yeah. Like I so you I'll use Britain's natural strongest man as an example. I trained for nearly two years to try and win that. Um well the first year I entered it, I came second, furious with myself, could have done better. I was like, all right, next year I'm gonna win it. And I grafted, I gave absolutely everything. Like I couldn't have done any more. Um and I've stood on the top of the podium, won first place, holding up Britain's natural title. And it was a hollow feeling. I was like, well, the heavens haven't opened. The angels haven't arrived. I've not had an epiphany. And I was like, well, why? Like, this is, this is what I wanted. And now when I look back, it, it's never the destination that we remember. It's never the destination. It's always the journey. I don't remember, if you ask me to recount even 10 minutes of one of the, high, the highest level rugby games I've played in, I couldn't tell you, but I could tell you inter, like, intricate details of our training sessions and the changing rooms and the banter and the beers and the, the drink and everything else. And it's the same as Strongman. I can't even remember how I won, what even the events were for my first British title. I can't remember, I can just about remember a couple of events from the Midlands Strongest Man that I won. Um, that's not what I remember. It's the process of getting to there that you remember. And if you read an autobiography of any successful athlete, they never talk about winning the World Cup. They talk about the training that took them to that point. It's the life and the journey. and the de- It's not the destination. It's the journey. Mm-hmm. And I think to maximize our ability to achieve our goals, it's to, yes, it's to, see, to have an end goal, to have a destination, to have a visualization of what that will feel like when we get there. But it's to reframe the journey and enjoy the work like I, I use this as an example with my guys the other day that there's a, a horrible hill local to here <clears throat> it's just never ending cycling up it the other day i must look, must look like an absolute madman halfway up the hill absolutely dying highest cadence i can possibly get my, my legs to turn smiling the biggest grin i could smile in absolute agony and it was just the idea of like good like this is good like i'm i'm testing myself i'm testing my ability my limits my how hard can i push but the reframe of that piece of work was this is shit this is hard i'm going to have to stop i'm going to have to get off the bike and it's our ability to enjoy the difficulties to enjoy the hardship and enjoy the hard work and that's what makes the the end destination even achieved in the first place and it's like we were saying again earlier offline but if you don't find your version of fitness, your version of goal, your version of training, your version of dieting, whatever it might be, 
you will fail because you'll not be able to reframe it and to enjoy it, which means you'll then not do the necessary steps, the necessary building blocks, and then you'll never get to that destination anyway. And I think that that's where the most successful coaches come into their own. It's like a lot of your stuff, the content that you put out, there's not one way, there's, there's many different ways to create a calorie deficit. Yeah. Like if it's your macros, calorie counting, portion control, whatever it is, like none of them are right, none of them are wrong. The right one is the one that is the one that suits you, your lifestyle, your ability, and your enjoyment of it. And I think that that's where so many of us end up missing the boat with our goals and our training and that, and what we want to try and achieve in in business, in goals, in career, in sport, whatever it is, is that we never actually find a way of doing it that we can enjoy, or we never reframe the journey to make it what is difficult enjoyable. Um. So yeah, I think one of the things that I definitely try and impress upon all of our members and the guys that I coach is this idea of find the joy in the work because that's the bit that you'll remember. That's the bit that you'll look back on with pride, not the end destination and not the goal. Yeah, I mean, again, I kind of come back slightly to something that we spoke about before we started recording was people's attitudes to apply themselves, you know, in a morning. Um, basically, we were talking about, you know, people going to work, to do their work, whether they want to go in and do it and be creative and get the best out of it, or is it a hassle and they spend the whole time thinking about lunchtime and then going home again and finishing the work, you know? And again, it's, it's what you do when you're there or how you're going to approach it and whether you, you actually enjoy it. And, uh, and if, if you don't, then... It's maybe, you know, a time to reassess things and either adjust it or move on. And I think it comes down to your perception of the reality that is in front of you. Like a lot of people, like there's days where I come into work and I'm like, fucking alarm's gone off again at 5 a.m. I do not want to get out of bed. I'm comfortable. It's cold, it's dark, I'm staying in bed. And there's days of that, that. And I think there's this idea of so many people in life, when you ask so many people what they want out of life, the answer is happiness. Now, this copped a bit of flack in our members group the other day, but I said I don't believe in happiness because happiness is an emotional response to a situation. Like, so I can wake up in the morning, find out I've won the lottery, but then crash my car. I'm no longer happy because I've just crashed my car. So I've not achieved this epiphany of perpetual happiness. Happiness is repeatedly finding happiness in the situations that we put ourselves in, we find ourselves in, and we do. So if the aggregate and the average of what we do creates happiness in our life, then yes, we will then be happy, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So, and I think that that's the problem some of us face, is that there's days where we wake up, we don't want to get out of bed, we don't want to do the work, and sometimes we do just half ass it. And then that spirals into, well, do I enjoy my career? Do I enjoy what I'm doing? Do I enjoy my job? Whereas you just then need to flick that switch and reframe it back into, okay, well, what parts of this do I enjoy? What is it that originally got me out of bed? What used to inspire me and motivate me and light a fire under me? Because the, one of the things the coronavirus has really reminded me is how much I find motivation in challenge. So not no, the, it might sound a little bit arrogant, but for me, the gym over the last few months had become not easy, but it had become consistent. Mm -hmm. We were in a good place financially, members wise, buildings were all finished. We were where we we're meant to be. And I was starting to get a little bit, <clears throat> for want of a better word, a little bit bored. Whereas now we're back thrown into the deep end in terms of challenge, change, trials and tribulations of what the economy is going to look like at the end of it. And that's massively re relit in the fire. Yeah. And it's reminded me for me that I need purpose. I need motivation, comfortability, consistency, normality is not what I'm about. That's not what motivates me and fires me up. Um, and I think that that's the thing we need to do is actually take that step back and go, okay, I'm not enjoying this right now, but what parts of it did used to motivate me, did used to fire me up because those are the bits we need to revisit when we're on a weight loss journey or a sporting journey or a business journey is there will be times where we can't be asked or we want to stop doing the work or maybe we're about to stop doing the work, but it's reframing it to remember well, what is it that used to motivate us? What is it that got us to this point? And then how can we then kick on to the next layer and the next level and keep pushing forward rather than just allow the downward spiral that will happen for many of us that 
we'll stop being true to our habits and our good actions and it will then create negativity and then obviously a step backwards in whatever the goal might be mm. um and i think that that's the thing is that a lot of people look for this idea of oh, i need to find my purpose in life i need to find happiness but it's finding the happiness in the work and finding the mm. happiness in reframing of the actions um and that's how stupid challenges like the 24 hour skier get done it's reframing it and reminding yourself why you're doing it and finding the joy in the in the bits where it gets difficult um otherwise you just get that little voice gets too loud and you just and you just stop altogether um and then that's catastrophic for our goals whether it's fat loss muscle building performance business career whatever it might be yeah i mean well definitely come a come along to the 24 hour skier that's for sure um that's an interesting one but i i I couldn't agree with you more you know i think it was mark manson that he coined in his book um the subtle art of not giving a fuck where there's a whole chapter on that where he talks about like happiness doesn't exist and you know he recites a couple of stories and, and whatnot and then he breaks the whole thing down then he he looks at things more from a fulfillment standpoint. So similar to what you're touching on there, you know, you're creating moments of happiness. You know, how you know how frequent are they? If they're less frequent, why are they less frequent? You know, and, and then you're you're ultimately building towards um that feeling of fulfillment. You know, what is fulfillment for you? And how do these things all couple together to create that fulfillment? And uh Otherwise, you really are just leaving yourself, you know, in that stupor of a mindset and the negative mindset of just constantly. I mean, I've, dude, I've been there. I remember, you know, God, and like my my late twe- teens and twenties, I almost like had a victim mentality. You know, it was always like a, a why me? You know, something bad happened or why me? You know, I. It's, it's their fault or it's circumstances fault. And, you know, again, hind, this is where hindsight's a, a gift almost. But I, I look back and I just think, Jesus, what was I thinking? And um, what a poor mentality to have. And, and again, it was only my fault. It was no, nobody else's fault. And I, I chose to recreate that, again, negative feedback loop and, and sit in it and do nothing about it. One of the... One of the things that we as humans are really crap at um, is looking in the mirror. It's taking responsibility for our reality and our situation. And there's there's two parts to this because your reality is what your perception of your reality is at the end of the day. Um, But self-reflection, self-inspection is something that we are all, generally speaking, crap at. We don't like doing it. If one of our peers, someone we know, a friend, a family member is achieving something, that indirectly holds a mirror up to them to then question whether they're doing enough. Am I doing enough? Well, he's done that with his business, so he's a dickhead. Like, oh, no, it's just shown you that maybe you could work a little bit harder as well. Um, but the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is if we're not able to look in the mirror and ask ourselves these questions, then we never will achieve the things that we want to because we can never review why we're doing it, what we're doing it for. We can never review the, the sense of fulfillment or the happiness in the work because we're, never, we're just mindlessly moving day to day, week to week, month to month. And that's where, from my reflection, is where unhappiness comes from for many people. It's because they have a general victim mentality and a general sense of it's everyone else's fault, it's not my fault, and it's, oh, they've got mummy and daddy's money, or, oh, well, they just managed to get a better facility than me, or, or so on and so forth. But as soon as you take responsibility for your own reality, you take responsibility for where you are right now, and then you start to make the steps and the plans and the goals to how to then move to the reality that you want, then you then create progress. But as long as you sit there going, it's everybody else's fault. And that happens by never holding up a mirror, never looking at yourself, never assessing where you're at. And one of the things I've challenged my members to do over the next 30 days is to write three goals. So a performance goal, a nutrition goal, and a mindset goal. And then create three non-negotiable actions each day for each of those goals. So that's just nine non-negotiables. Sounds easy. Should be simple. And then the challenge for them is at the end of the day to review, did I do my non-negotiables? 
And if I didn't, why not? And not a, oh, well, it was the missus's fault because she brought back pizza. Well, yeah, she did, but you didn't have to eat it. Like, so it, it's that genuine honesty with yourself as to what, what your actions were and why were your actions those actions that day. Because until you can be that honest with yourself over just nine non-negotiable goals, you'll never be honest with yourself with every other part of your performance, your nutrition, your goal setting, your relationship, and, and so on and so forth. And I think that the ability to self-reflect and hold that mirror up to yourself is the first step in finding that general sense of fulfillment and happiness, because that then make, gives you a better insight as to who you are as a person. And then it's this idea of, do your behaviors match your expectations? And if they don't, do you either need to change your expectations or change your behaviors? Mm -hmm. And then with that, you can then create a better sense of what your expectations in life, in sport, in career are going to be, and then plan your trajectory and your course to get there. But until you're willing to hold up that mirror and have that self-reflection daily for me, then I think you'll always struggle to find that sense of fulfillment and happiness because you don't even know what fulfillment and happiness looks like. Yeah. Oh. I'm not, I'm not even going to follow that up, mate. Um, you couldn't have Did said it any sense? better. <laughs> I sometimes worry that I'm just waffling. <laughs> no, honestly. Um, yeah, just absolutely not, to be honest. Like I said, I mean, there's parts, you're, you're kind of just saying what I'm, I'm thinking, but my own version of it. And again, anybody listening to this can only be nodding their head because it's like you said, even you saying that might be difficult for some people. They, they might listen to that and think, oh man, like that's me, you know, but if that helps somebody, if that helps somebody become more reflective and become more honest with themselves and, and really develop those non-negotiables, I mean, it's you, you, like, like what you, that, that simple example that you just said of what you guys are doing with your members, anybody can do that. Like anybody can do yeah. it right today. And it can be to any metric that suits them and accommodates them in this very situation with the coronavirus. Um, and they can obviously use that to plan themselves to get the best out of the situation for whatever they want it to be. And then once the, this lockdown and the coronavirus, you know, has subsided, they've just developed, you know, all these positive habits in a very, very difficult environment and if that's the case, then they can take those habits and behaviors. And once, you know, there's difficult environments passed, can you imagine what it's going to be like, you know, once they've got, a, you know, free reign to go wherever they want and, and all these other things. It's the, yeah. And I, I, I forget who said it, so I can't try and pass it off as my end. I've definitely never said anything this profound, but it's the idea of we all want to know who we are. At some point in our life, we ask that question, don't we? Like, who am I? Mm. What do I want out of life? What do I want to achieve? For me, the easiest place to start is who am I not? And like it. so it's easy for you to tell. I can choose things that I absolutely do not want to be. So for me, it's like not having commitment to something that I said I was going to do, to not doing the work. So I can find who I am by defining who I am not, if that makes sense. But you can't do that until you've held up a mirror to yourself to look at your behaviors, to look at your actions, to then say, well, actually, yeah, that's stuff that I categorically will not do. And those are my behaviors, those are my actions. And then with that, you can then start piece together going, right, well, actually, if I'm not that, like I am an inner fat kid, I, and I know that. And I know that I have a constant daily battle to maintain some form of calorie control. But so I, but I know who I am because of that, by who I am not, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things where the self-reflection and self, um, self-inspection comes from, because a lot of people look at self-reflection as negative self-talk. They beat themselves up. They're like, oh, well, your non-negotiable is to eat 3,000 calories. You ate 3,500 calories, you're useless. But it's not that. It's, okay, I ate, I ate 500 calories too many. Why did I do it? How do I make sure I don't do it again? Okay, now I've learned something from it. And it's that idea of the classic Conor McGregor quote of we win or we learn. Mm -hmm. And I think that people view every time they do something that isn't conducive to their goals as a loss. 
Now it's only a loss if we don't learn from it. And that goes back to everything I've ever done in any sporting accolade or sporting approach is I don't care whether I win or lose. I care whether I learn something from it and then can help show others those lessons in the process. So many people won't do something like We've got two or three women in our membership that are desperate to want to try strong woman, but they're scared of what if they do it and they fail. But you only fail if you don't learn something from it. Learn something about yourself, learn something about others, learn something about a different sport. And I think that as self-reflection, self-inspection, it's not about being negative towards yourself, telling yourself you're useless and highlighting all your flaws. It's highlighting areas that we can improve and we can get better. And it's no different to a child filling in a test and getting a couple wrong answers and then them having to go away and work on those answers. It's exactly the same theory. If you've got a couple of wrong answers on your test score at the end of the day, it's right, that's something I now need to work on. It's something I need to learn. It's something I need to get better at. That's not, oh, well, I'm shit at that. What's the point? I'll never never succeed. I'm just a failure. Mm -hmm. And again, it comes down to our framing of that failure and looking at it as a lesson. And I think that's something that we can all be better at in the general sense yeah um again i can only i can only agree with that especially from my own you know experiences in competition and as a coach as well you know i mean um you know we'll come on to speak about your iron man uh, venture and one of my clients you know when he first came to me he was not an active guy at all you know, he was relatively overweight. Um, he had a really bad back, a bad knee issue. The constant, you know, the thing of, you know, always working and he was a family man. Well, he still is. And obviously we worked on that and we just took it piece by piece. You know, we, we removed or, you know, helped his back pain. And we got him stronger. He had limited equipment to limited time. So again, we started working on, again, what he could do from a dietary perspective. And over, over the course of possibly six to nine months, as, as you'd expect, things were chipping away. And we did the best we could with what he had. And he's a very, very positive-minded guy anyway. So, you know, even if he did have a negative day or do something, like you said, about went from 3,000 calories to 3,500 You know, he just accepted it because he was learning more, you know, um, in our our calls and in his check-ins and stuff. He was learning more about, you know, methods and and the evidence behind all these things. And then all of a sudden, he, um, he took inspiration. I think it was from one of my other clients who competed in powerlifting for the first time. And I was chatting to him in one of our calls and I was talking to him about, why I think everybody should experience a form of competition. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, powerlifting or like rugby. It could be just doing even a 5K race, you know, showing up at the starting line, hearing everybody cheering and getting that feeling of what it's like to achieve something. And and I was talking to him about that and and he sat on it and thought and he came back to me and he said, you know what, you know, after what you, you saying that, I really fancy doing something. And <laughs> and he entered a coast to coast race, a cycle race. So he lives in Dubai. So this is in Dubai. Literally doesn't cycle. So you had to go and get all the kit. I had to go and learn, you know, speak to some people and learn about the program and how I can integrate the cycling. Um, like I know how to program for like marathons and stuff. So similar, you know, the the program methodologies was quite similar to that. You know, we, so we, over the course of, I think it was about six months and it was great. He loved it and he ended up achieving it. He did the, the coast to coast. I can't remember how many miles it was. It was ridiculous. And he did it. I think it was like seven, seven hours, 40 in his face. He's, the photos afterwards and that was just absolutely amazing. And um, we were actually working toward uh, him doing another one um, this month, but obviously that's not going to happen. But you know, that happened out of nothing and it happened within a year. You know, a guy who could, who was in pain all the time with back pain, overweight, didn't understand anything about nutrition to a year later being super comfortable. He really doesn't need me in many aspects, 
which is great, but you know, we're, we're continuing to work on things and helping them achieve even more things. And that was within a year, you know, and. But I think that one of the things that so many people struggle with is this idea of, so if, if your man there had looked at himself on day one and looked at himself now, he would have said, absolutely not. There's no way I'll be able to achieve that. That's, that's, that's silly, I would imagine. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> but it isn't until you start chipping away and doing what you can with what you have that you then start to believe. Mm-hmm. And momentum creates this belief and then belief creates more work and more action and then you get to the end destination. But I think one of the things that a lot of people could definitely strive to be better at is finding what their version of greatness is and what their version of pro- progress is. Comparison at the end of the day is a thief of joy. And we all compare our own abilities, our own goals, our own following, our own impact, our own gym size. It, I, social media is the modern day dick measuring contest, isn't it, for many? <laughs> and at the end of the day, so many of us compare our, our own success to others. Now, I got one of our clients message me this morning to say, I needed to tell somebody that um, five months ago, I couldn't even walk up this massive hill in Worcester without having to stop three times because I was out of breath and couldn't walk. Today, I ran up it as part of a 3K, didn't stop, and I'm so happy, I'm buzzing, I'm, I'm loving, lo- lo- living the dream. And it's, it's this idea that, to him, that's, that's his current Everest. But I guarantee in 12 months' time, he'll look back at that and be like, is that it? Like, is that, I was genuinely getting excited about that. Because he'll continue to push the boat and continue to push forward. Because your own version of greatness is relative to you and your situation and your reality and what you want to achieve. Um, <clears throat> we can all compare ourselves to everybody else, blame everybody else, or blame, be that whole victim mentality that we were speaking about. But until you actually figure out what the next step is on your journey, you'll never actually take the first step and then the next one and the next one. And it's like we were saying earlier on, with things like, I, I ruptured my bicep um, last game in January. Um, had to have surgery the following week, get it reattached. And everyone was telling me, oh, your Ironman dream, that's over, it's done, isn't it? And it's like, I, I try to live by the mantra, if you do what you can with what you have available to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was Simon Sinek that said, is your lack of progress a lack of resources or a lack of resourcefulness? So I've lost a resource. I've lost an arm. <laughs> so I mean, I couldn't swim, um, albeit temporarily. Um, but I still had other resources available to me and I could still be resourceful with what I had, which meant I could still make steps forward. I could still progress. I could t- still see improvement in my biking and in my running, albeit I just couldn't do it in the same way I was doing it before bicep re- uh, detachment and then surgery. And it's this idea that if you can look at that as a, well, that's the end and that's the excuse and that's the way I can get out of this. Or you can look at it again, well, it's just going to be another chapter in the autobiography. It's just going to be another layer of ridiculousness to how I managed to compete an Ironman whilst also in the same year detaching and having a bicep reattached. Um, But that mindset only comes from taking small steps, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And that's what creates momentum. And a lot of people look at, what some people are doing in their training, in their life, in their goals, think, oh, I could never do that. But if you actually tr- had a time machine and went back to when they first started, they, was, they were making the same first steps that they now need to make. It's just that they've done it consistently over a long period of time and are now where they are. Mm. But I think this idea of comparing our own progress to other people and comparing our own journeys is just a pointless, it's a, it's a fool's errand. <clears throat> Yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the absolute worst, um, you know, regardless <laughs> of what it's in, you know, whether it's in their fitness journeys or business or, or whatever, it's, um, you know, I make a point of every so often going through my own Instagram following and, um, and just doing, a, doing the classic call, but I don't do it, you know, just to kind of clean up the numbers. I I, I kind of go through it and think, do I know this person? What does this person offer me? How does this person make me feel, etc.? And just remove the triggers, as you say, the self-comparison, because at the end of the day, social media is our choice. It's free. Um, or whether it's social media or not, you know, it's free and, and we're free to expose ourselves to it. Mm. And if we're continuing to expose ourselves to, to triggers and negative feedback, then you, you know, you've got to really sit down and ask yourself why you're continuing to do that. 
And I suppose yeah. this comes back to, you could almost link that to your own habits and behaviors as well. You know, if you keep getting up every day and repeating these habits and behaviors that are making you feel like shit and, <laughs> and, and encouraging triggers and stuff, then at some point, where are you going to sit down and think, uh, like, why, why do I keep doing this? And, you know, do, do, do I need to completely clean slate it? Or does it come back to what you were saying before about the reflection thing and the non-negotiables? And it's, um, it's almost like, I mean, we're making it sound like a simple process. I can, I can totally get that, especially for some people. But, um, and it's, and again, this is where it comes back to the whole, you know, this is where you really have to develop patience and, and give yourself the time to, to kind of go through these processes and almost like exercises, you know? Yeah. You need to give yourself the, um, sorry, someone's knocking on my door. <laughs> I have a friend that's a baker and she's just leaving me legend. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> leaving me uh, biscuits, bread and eggs. What a legend. Um, I forgot. I've completely lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> <all right>. um, <laughs> you know, something that we should probably speak about is we, you've, you've touched on Iron Man and you've, we've, we've obviously gotten up to the point where you'd been uh, Britain's strongest man. Now, obviously I'm, I'm familiar with what you've done, but anybody listening won't be. So, I mean, how does a guy, let's fill in the gap here. Um, how does a guy go from, what, 184 kilos, Britain's strongest man, to then all of a sudden saying, this is not for me anymore. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give Iron Man a shot. Um, you know, yeah. what, what happened there? So I moved into Strongman, as I say, and then competed in that for three or four years, roughly. Um, competed at... Um, Again, like a high standard was competing at England's Strongest Man, trying to break into that very top kind of Giants Live, World's Strongest Man field. Um, won Midland's Strongest Man uh, two years in a row. Won Britain's Drug Free Strongest Man two years in a row. Um, and then I'd gone up to Edinburgh, I believe it was, uh, for a Giants Live competition to try and qualify for the, the biggest shows that there are. And um, I basically, I've been living in with knee pain for about a year at that point. I've already had a, like an MCL clear out and all sorts of stuff on my knee from my rugby playing days. But it was that classic. It hurt after I trained. And then, but as long as I warmed up, then I was fine. Then it started to hurt whilst I was training. And then I couldn't get it to then not ache when I wasn't training. And it just kind of become quite debilitating. But as with many people, when they're living with pain, it's just, you you don't realize you're living with pain until it's not there anymore. Mm -hmm. But so I'd kind of, my knee was getting worse, but I was just ignoring it, carrying on, carrying on. And at that point, um, I just deadlifted 400 kilos, was on a massive high thinking, right, I'm, this is, this is my year. I'm going to make it. And then, um, yeah, just one of the last events on that day, my knee just folded underneath me. Um, couldn't put any weight on it and then ended up limping back to the airport, got on a plane and, and came home. And I, that was the trigger that finally kind of spurred me to actually get it properly looked at and properly assessed because it's one of those things where you're in that, I mean, that year particularly that I would competed eight weekends in a row, four times of which were abroad or in different countries. So you don't have time to stop and get an MRI or get someone to look at it. It's just, I sit, patch it up, we go again. Um, and that's probably the rugby mentality that one of the negatives of the rugby mentality of it's well, as long as it's not hanging off, then we'll <laughs> carry on. Um, but yeah, so I saw um, a couple of different physiotherapists, sports therapists um, and knee specialists. And basically my patella tendon was just too thick uh, in, in the simplest of terms. And that was causing a load of pain and aggravation in the knee. So they could clear it out. And I believe the term is called debriding it, which is essentially chop a bit off either side. But that would have given me um, their best guess was around a 75, 80% chance of rupture under load. Um, and at that point, squatting 380 kilos was my best at that point in life. The idea of a patella tendon rupturing with that amount of weight on your back, you're not just playing with another injury, you're possibly playing with your life. Um, and 
it was one of those things where, do you know what, I could, because I've always been big on self-reflection and self-analysis, and it was at that point where I was like, do you know what, if you'd have offered me this at the start of Strong Run, that I'd have won the titles I'd won, I'd lifted what I'd lifted, I'd have built the respect of my peers and everything else, then I would have taken it. So why, why continue? Because yeah. the, the risk versus reward is significant. The, there's no financial reward in it anyway, because Strong One's not a particularly well-funded sport. Well, it's not fu- well-funded in, in the slightest. Um, I was sacrificing time with my newborn daughter. The business was taking a hit because I was out of the country every bloody weekend competing. Mm. Um, and so it was just that decision of going, well, yes, I could have the, the surgery. I could have um, the work done and could continue, carry on regardless. But is the risk versus the reward and why am I doing it? And like I say, I'd, I'd achieved a lot. I'd achieved more than I ever thought I possibly could have done. And that first day I stepped into a strongman gym and that was the decision. It was right. Okay, well let's, let's get healthy. And if anyone's listening, that's been 185 kilos, <laughs> then you can relate that it's pretty shit. Um, you're heavy, you feel out of breath all the time, tying your shoelaces is a difficulty, but you convince yourself that that's what your reality has to be to be the best at the sport that you're doing. Like most sports people that are are, are trying to compete at a high level, it's a very selfish pursuit. Um, And I'd just chosen my sport over everything else. So the decision was made to now to lose the weight, to to drop the weight that I no longer needed to be that heavy to be uh, trying to be a professional strong man so the weight loss journey began and like I said uh, said earlier on that for me it was never about okay right well I want to run an Ironman if you, even if you just said to me a year ago you'll run an Ironman this year I'd have laughed at you the idea was finding uh, goals along the way that I could work towards so the first goal was just to get down to 160 which was just drop literally just drop 25 kilos just to be able to tie my shoelaces to be able to walk upstairs without feeling out of breath. But then other things came in. So like being able to walk on my hands, being able to compete in the national fitness games, um, then being able to run 10 K and all these things, people laughed at me. They were like, I remember when I said to the guys here that oh, I'm going to learn to walk on my hands and they were like, shut up. No, you're not. And then four weeks later I could take, I could walk about five meters upside down um and that goes back to the earlier point about don't seek external validation and approval to do things that you want to try because often people will tell you it's not possible even though it is um and it was just generally choosing goals that i knew were out of reach right now but if i kept on the course and kept true to the journey then i would achieve them so walking on my hands competing in national fitness games which we somehow managed to win um and it was just one of those things where just success created more success momentum built more momentum ran a 10k didn't die ran um a duathlon it was like a mountain bike based duathlon again didn't die and then the 24 hour skier came about and then after that it was like right well what next and then the iron man was obviously the most logical yeah. thing to do apparently so that's how <laughs> we've ended up on the iron man but yeah that's the journey from strong man to where i am at the minute basically it was a, a sport that was taken away from me it wasn't taken away from me. It was an active choice that I decided to walk away from it with the injuries that I had and the limitations that were there in front of me. But it was that choice of being a victim and be, oh, woe is me. I've lost my definition. Because so many of us define ourselves by our career or by our sport. Yeah. I'm John the Strongman. And I did that for many years. It was like, that was my definition of who I was. But it's reframing it, taking responsibility for it and saying, right, well, now that that's no longer there, what do I do now? Because I can sit here and wallow in my own self-misery and pity and oh well I've lost the the thing I was good at or I can turn it into a positive see what journeys I can go on what lessons I can learn and how I can then promote those lessons and share them with other people because I don't have all the answers none of us do like you've got some influence out influencers or wannabe influencers that try and make out that they are they are god and that they know the answers to everything and i hope whenever i've been on any podcast i i come across as somebody that certainly doesn't have the answers at all it's just i've learned a lot of lessons and i'm just trying to share the lessons that i've learned um take them use them ignore them think i'm a dickhead whatever you may do with them (laughs) it's not this is the way to live your life it's just these are the lessons that i've learned on the journey that i've been on that's been fairly 
um, a bit of a roller coaster from rugby to pro strongman levels down to now Ironman pursuits. <laughs> yeah, you, you touched on a really good point there. And, um, you know, where you were saying, even if people didn't like you, what can they take from what you're saying and what can they take from your journey? And, um, and I've came across this sort of personal conclusion quite a few times, you know, in the past where I, I've maybe really disliked somebody or disliked something and almost like stewed in it, you know, wallowed in it and be like, oh, you, you just, you cannot accept anything they do or anything you hate about them or, or whatnot. But then along the way, something changes or, or it does with me. I'm almost, this is something I, I personally dislike about myself, but I almost like it at the same time. So I dislike the fact that, you know, I, I go down this journey or, or <laughs> negative pursuits of disliking something or somebody based on minimal feedback or information or even gossip or whatever. But eventually, you know, I, I do listen, you know, I don't just like kind of dismiss it and, and that's an absolute thought, you know, I do entertain it and then I slowly start, slow, come to the realization, oh, what's, there's some, there's some reason they're there or there's some reason that this has happened and, and look at the patterns. And previously you mentioned Conor McGregor. Now, I remember when I, um, when I first came across Conor McGregor, I absolutely hated the guy. Like, I could not stand him. And, you know, I'd see on social media people talking about how great he is, blah, blah, blah. And I just despised him. I just couldn't stomach it. I didn't, but the thing is, I didn't know anything about him. You know, it was just, there was were, there were some reason that I just didn't like him. But then once I started looking in between the lines and listening to the, the things he was saying, and he talks about you know, mastering your craft and doing the things that people won't do, you know, work on his skills, you know, work on his mindset and stuff. And I thought, you know, oh, I, I like this guy. Yeah, I, I really like him. And now I absolutely love him. You know, I mean, okay, I don't condone all his behaviors. I mean, but <laughs> well, you know, I think the guy walks a walk and talks a talk. There's a lot of lessons that we can learn from a lot of different people. That's like saying that we only li I'm only going to read an autobiography about Iron Man because that's what I'm doing at the minute. Yeah. Like, there's lessons and there's clues in everything that we read, see, do, and then our perception of the reality of what we see it as it is. And I think that that's what I've always tried to do with my social media, with me being the owner of the gyms and everything else is this idea of, I don't have the answers. I don't, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. I'm just going to share with you my lessons and what I've learned from the life that I've lived. And I've not perfect. I've made mistakes. I've messed things up. I've not self-reflected. I've not, I've done things on emotion rather than logic. And yeah. we, we all do. And if anyone tells you they haven't, then they're lying. But I think that, one of the things that I guess one of the benefits of having such a varied sporting pursuit over the last 15 years for me is that it's given me a lot of insights into different skills, different things you possibly need to progress, to achieve, to hit these ridiculous markers of, of whatever your goals might be. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's one of the things that hopefully my journey and story is will have given people yeah. with some of the stuff we've spoken about is this, idea of learning lessons from everything that we're doing and the people that are around us um there's many people that are listening to this that probably will have no interest in being a, a high level strongman or running an ironman but there's still lessons that can be applied to whatever their goal and whatever their pursuit pursuit yeah. is um but yeah so i mean that was the journey in terms of why i decided to drop the weight and what i've then dedicated the last kind of four years to is then sharing those lessons with our members and the people that we coach and and trying to inspire them to find their version of their greatness and what they want to try and achieve with their their sport their health their their physical performance um because i think too often we are we get stuck in this idea of i am what i am and not prepared to change, not prepared. And I think the thing is, the biggest, the biggest thing that I realized when I was a strong man was in order to achieve what we want to achieve, we have to be prepared to give up, for, give up what we are. So for me to lose 60 kilos, I had to give up that life. I had to give up being a strength athlete. I had to give up chasing weight on a bar. I had to ch give up chasing 5,000 calories a day. I had to give up that headspace of, I'm going to be the strongest motherfucker to walk the British shores. So I had to give that up 
to then move forward. And that's what a lot of us struggle with. Like, I'm a massive believer that I'm not about what I did yesterday. I'm about what I do today. No. Sorry. There he is. <laughs> There's this idea that so many of us get stuck in this head space. Oh, well, I used to be strong. I used to do this. I used to play county rugby or I used to mm. like, that's all cool and all. And it's something we can all look back on. We can be proud of. We can all tell those old war stories, but what are you doing today? What are we doing tomorrow? And I think that that's, that's one of the things that's helped me go through many different sports, and many different changes is not to get so hung up on who we were and be prepared to give all of that up to move forward to who we want to be. Like, I hate looking in the mirror at the minute at my tiny little arms, my traps have disappeared, my quads are disappearing in front of me. Like that shit I spent 10 years building, but that stuff isn't relevant to me to run an Ironman. So you've got to be prepared to give up your old self yeah. to move forward to your new self. And then this is where this idea of your self-reflection comes in is, is the pain of giving up your old self greater than the pain of staying where you are. And I think, again, unless you can have that self-reflection to make those changes, you'll never be able to go on the, like, the significant change that I've been on or even just a smaller change of losing a few kilos. Um, you've got to have that preparedness to, to give that person up because that's not who you want to be anymore or not who you are anymore. Yeah, that's, I think that's, that's a pretty powerful statement there, you know, because there's so many people that, that do continue to pursue a sport or training method or dietary method or whatever, because they're just not willing to let it go. And they've almost like ingrained it into their own identity and values in some way, shape or form. And you, well, you see these people all the time, you know, these are the people that have spent 10, 20, 30 years in that mindset and in that position. And they look back on it and they do somewhat regret it because, you know, it's kind of held them back. And, and it almost comes back to what you said previously about your knee. You know, you're, you're, what you're doing now, you're in a position to do it now, whereas, you know, five years in the future, your, your knee might not allow it. So... But then how often do people just stay in that position and say, well, you know what, I, I, I'm not going to go for it because I'm going to sit in this identity or value driven bias. And then all of a sudden they are, they do become that person that the knee can't allow them to do the, the, the Ironman. And, uh, and that is that, you know. I think that's it. I, I would always rather do something and fail than look back and wish that I'd at least tried it or had given yeah. it a go. And people don't get that. People don't understand that. Like, I put up a photo on my Instagram the other day of um, 185 kilo John, and then a photo of me running uh, the final kilometer of my uh, virtual triathlon that I ran this week. And one of the old guys I used to compete with in strongman, basically, uh, I forget the exact wording, but it was something like, "Oh, bring back strong fat John. He was better." And it's just like, because that's their perception of what they want me to be, because that's who they are. And, and that's the biggest issue that we have is that I could have taken that to heart because it's almost pissing on the bonfire that I've just run a virtual triathlon. Mm. But at the same time, like we were saying earlier, it's just held up a mirror to them that their identity is so strongly entwined with their physical strength, whereas mine isn't anymore. So I'm happy to not be strong, John. As, as he called it, because strength on a bar doesn't define me anymore. Whereas four years ago, that I lived and died by the weight on the barbell. So again, it comes down to who you are is who you are not. And I'm not no longer defined by what's on the bar. I'm now defined on what my body can do in other areas, in other aspects, in, in other physical pursuits. Um, but I think we often get stuck in this headspace of defining ourselves on a former identity of ourselves or one that we expect other people to think of us or what they do think of us. Like all of the people that the majority of people that follow me on Instagram were there from the beginning when I was a strongman. So they, they can't get their head around the fact of why have you gone from deadlifting 400 kilos to now looking like you look like and running like a half marathon for fun. Yeah. And, um, Again, it's this idea that you have to have this self-reflection on what do you want to do? What do you want to define yourself as? Because you can't allow other people to do that for you because they will define you based on their reality of what they define themselves as, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I mean, 
I want to be mindful of your time, John. I mean, because I think we've just gone something like an hour and a half. Don't worry, mate. I'm on lockdown. I've got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, I mean, from from my knowledge anyways, with, with Iron Man, you know, you've got two different ones. You've obviously got the, 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 the shorter distance one as per se and the longer distance one. I'm going to take a stab and say that you're going for the uh, longer distance one. Oh, all in, all in. <laughs> well, so basically we did, we did that 24 hour ski erg and we got to the end of it and it was just a case of, well, that didn't break us. So what will? Yeah. And then somebody said, oh, why don't you try a triathlon? And then someone said, oh, well, an Ironman is four times the normal triathlon. I'm like, well, if that's the hardest triathlon you can do, let's do that. So, um, we signed up for that and then obviously we were training for that. So the idea originally was we'd do a sprint triathlon and then an Olympic distance and a half Ironman and then a full Ironman. Mm -hmm. um, as it has transpired, I then ruptured a bicep and coronavirus arrived. So if the Ironman goes ahead in July, which is very unlikely, or it gets postponed to later on in the year, then we'll probably just have to go straight into full Ironman. So yeah, so yeah swim 2.4 miles bike 112 miles and then run a marathon at the end of it so yeah pretty pretty intense but i i actually think it'll be easier than the 24 hour ski erg but i guess time will tell <laughs> <laughs> i mean 20 to be fair and i think i think we're on a similar well not a similar wavelength and you know one to challenge themselves because for some weird reason, you know, when I was at my heaviest, before I'd even started anything fitness-based, you know, I think I was like 21 stone, going for like a two and a half K run, gave me shin splints and all sorts, but that was my starting thing. And I remember just always thinking, I really want to do a triathlon. I really want to do a triathlon. And I don't know where it came from. It still exists. But I'm, I'm obviously more aware and I'm more educated and stuff on what a triathlon actually is and, and what it, you know, what it'll require. But, you know, looking into stuff like the Ironman and stuff, I'm all of a sudden thinking, well, you know what, sack a triathlon. I quite fancy the Ironman. Again, similar to you, why pick a level and say, okay, well, let's see what it's like. You know, why not swing for the swing for the rafters and prepare for it, you know? and it's going to be hard regardless whether you did an olympic distance or whether you did a full ironman it's still mm, yeah. there's still going to be parts of that where it's shit where it's really difficult and you have to embrace the difficulty and the grind of it it's just in an ironman those sections are probably a little bit longer and a little bit more drawn out um instead of a couple of hours you talk in a day but the the thing is as well like the more you get into it the more your perception of distance changes mm. so it's like when i was the strongest I ever was like for me 400 kilo deadlift was 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 just gold standard it's what I needed to achieve it's what I had to do whereas to a normal person that's that's insane that's a silly number but when you're enraptured like encapsulated into that world that's just the number that's just what it is and now that I've gone down the other route with the Ironman so I did the I kept getting nominated for the run five donate five nominate five and I was like uh, I've been nominated that many times. I'll just run a virtual triathlon. So I ran three, cycled 40, and then ran 10. Um, and loads of people then messaged me that were friends that have no concept of distance running or anything. We're like, oh, that's amazing. That's, that's amazing. Well done, blah, blah, blah. Whereas for me now, that's just a normal training day. That's two and a half hours on a bike or on foot. Yeah. It's not. And that isn't to belittle it. And if somebody's goal is to run a triathlon, absolutely all power high five to you. But it's this idea that the more you go down the rabbit hole, the more your yeah. perception of what these distances are changes. And I don't think I've met many that have done things like a half marathon and then haven't gone, oh, I want to try a marathon now, or done a half Ironman and then ended up going and doing a full Ironman mm -hmm. because your perception changes. Whereas if you just said to me at day one, I want you to later on today run a, an Olympic distance triathlon, absolutely not whereas if i had to go and do it again now it would be fine because your your reality changes your your perception of it changes and that just becomes your day-to-day -day, rather than it being something yeah. that scares or intimidates or worries you 
and that's how I now try to live my life and how I try to have view my body is this idea, the whole Dan John idea of, can you go? If you, if you knocked yeah. rock up tomorrow and was like, oh, we're going to go run a marathon. I'd be like, yeah, okay, cool. Or you went, oh, we want to do some deadlift one RM testing. Yeah. Okay, cool. I can do that as well. Like it's this idea of my body is now an expression of being able to do. It's like, I think it's Ollie Marchand that says train everything to prepare, um, to prepare for anything or, or be ready for anything. Um, and that's pretty much what I'm trying to do with mine now, because then it, it shows you how, how many limitations you've imposed on yourself by this idea of you thinking you can't do stuff. Mm. And then as soon as you've done it, you're like, oh, actually I can. And it wasn't that hard or it was hard, but I got it done. Um, but I think that's where the mental resilience and mental toughness is built because it's your exposure to, to being challenged and to being in difficult situations. Um, you couldn't just off the bat try and run an Ironman because you don't have enough mental resilience built up to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea of this mental toughness, mental resilience thing comes, I've, I've looked into this a lot since my, my ski erg, because a lot of people said to me, like, oh, I don't know anyone that has the mental resilience to do 24 hours nonstop on a ski erg. Now, so you've got a little one, haven't you? you oh, got yeah. A, yeah. Wow. yeah. So, don't know how little he is but <laughs> <laughs> so if i if i took a family member off you and said right you're never going to see that that family member again unless you do 24 hours on a ski erg you do 24 hours on a ski erg it's not that you can't it's just you haven't found a big enough reason why you're doing it yet um and that's the biggest that was the biggest eye opener for me from the ski erg was this idea of we can all we're all capable of great things we're all capable of doing ridiculous things we just need to find the reason why we're doing it. And that reason will then mean that we don't stop. Um, and I think that that goes back to this whole idea of understanding your why, understanding what your definition of greatness is, understanding what you are not to understand what you are. Mm -hmm. And with that, you can then get these stupid things like a 24 hour ski erg or like an Ironman done because you understand why you're doing it. You understand why you're not going to stop. And then you can reframe the work that you're doing to find the joy in the work and the joy in the difficulty because you understand the bigger picture. Um, whereas a lot of people jump into, oh, I'm going to go do a marathon. Why are you doing it? Oh, I don't know. I just think I should. How did you get on? Oh, I stopped at 10K because it uh, like, <laughs> what I mean? it's, those, it's those very different um, perceptions of it. But if you understand why you're doing these things and you understand how, what your definition of it is, then we can all do it. It's just, you have to do that self-reflection and self-inspection to understand why you are doing it though. Otherwise you're just doing it for the sake of it. Like I, if I was doing a 24 hour ski erg just for some external gratification or validation, that's not enough to push me for, to the nerve damage that I ended up pushing myself to. And the same as whether you were to do an Ironman, if you're doing it just for the Instagram likes, yeah. that's not, that's not strong enough to get you to the end. Um, but that's why you need to have the self-reflection to understand why you're doing it to then mean that you have a big enough reason to keep going when it does get hard and when it does hurt. Yeah, I mean, touching on that, there's a book that I read last year. I think it's called uh, Beautiful Constraints. And it, it's, it's all the, again, I think the title can kind of give it away a wee bit, whereas it, it shows you that there's different ways to be motivated through different levels of constraints and it, and it touches on you know whether it's uh, aggressive whether it's um, empathetic and, and whatnot and i found this when it came to endurance based stuff um you know the you touch on this on your i think it's on your youtube vlog uh, where you were t um, i think you've got like two episodes or so uh, with the iron man stuff and you were talking about how the body, you can always push the body further than the mind will take it or the mind will allow it. And, um, and I've ex personally experienced this a number of times and it's always through endurance based stuff. And I remember when I did a, a 50 mile trail run and I only knew, <laughs> um, this sounds a bit stupid to be honest, but I, I did about three or four uh, 10Ks and I thought this trail run was another 10K. And I was persuaded by a friend of mine, Kelly, who's an ultra, I think she's done like ultra triathlons and all sorts. It's insane. Um, the girl's got too much energy. And um, so she persuaded me to do this. And she was like, oh, let's do this. I was like, cool, cool, cool. Signed up for it. And then I got an email through 
uh, about two weeks before it saying, oh, are you ready for your, your half marathon? So I text Kelly. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa what's going on here? I thought it was a 10K. She's like, no, no, it's a half marathon. And I was like, Jesus, I've never run more than a 10K. Are you fucking kidding me? She's like, no, you, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. So again, I, I can't try and push myself to, to run, be prepared for a 10K, uh, sorry, from a 10K to a half marathon in less than two weeks. So I turned up on the night. And uh, to be fair to her, she ran with me. But it was, I never stopped once. I ran through the whole thing. And in the end of it, I was just like, oh, I just, just ran a half marathon uh, with like no preparation. And um, I didn't find it difficult. You know, don't get me wrong. My legs didn't, you know, they didn't thank me for it for a, a few days afterwards. But then all of a sudden I was kind of like, oh, I just ran a half marathon. And it was a trail run as well. So it was over two. One of the hills was bloody steep. But it, it really was about the mindset, you know, having Kelly there to, to chat to throughout. I never once thought about the pain. I never once had an element of doubt in my head. And since then, you know, I've, I've gone and done a few other things personally. But again, it's always the approach of just how do you, how do you set your mind up for it? What are you going to be thinking about? You know, yeah. do you want to spend the whole time wanting to give up or giving yourself, giving yourself a, a reason to give up and then start developing excuses to give to people on social media or whatever? It's irrelevant anyway. Um, or do you think you can really you know, reframe your thoughts and give yourself a reason to, to complete it and show what you can actually do, you know? It really does come down to why you're doing it and why why you want to do it. It's this idea of, and I, I've said this before, like, if I, it's that quote, if I quit, no one cares, but I'll know. Yeah. Like, there's so many times I'm out, I've got training, I've got to do an hour and a half training later that no one else other than my coach knows that I'm going to, that I'm meant to be doing. So I could just do an hour no one else knows no one else would really care my coach isn't going to tell me off that much but <laughs> i'll know and i made a commitment a non-negotiable commitment that for me to get to the start of the ironman i will never have missed a training session so at least if i don't get the ironman done i can say it wasn't for lack of effort mm -hmm. and i think that that's the problem is that it's this if we don't know why we're doing it and then we haven't then set non-negotiable actions to achieve it then it all very quickly falls apart, unravels, and we find excuses, reasons, victim mentality creeps in, and we can then blame everyone else under the sun of, of why we failed. Mm. But it's like the ski erg. So my preparation to do 24 hours continually on a ski erg was uh, eight days. <sighs> so at that, that point, there wasn't any... So the backstory to this was... There's a, a local lad called Oscar that needed half a million pounds, I think it was, uh, raising to pay for him to go to, I think it's Singapore, for life-saving cancer treatment. They weren't doing it on the NHS, so he had to pay to get it done abroad. Time was running out. There was still another, I think, like £100,000 that needed earning. And um, so we, we offered to do a 24-hour team ski erg event. So everyone throughout the course of the day would keep a ski erg running, and then that would generate money. But as you can imagine... Um, with the whole county trying to generate funds. It wasn't really making that much headway in terms of sponsorship. Mm. So I was like, right, well, what can we do to make this more ridiculous so that we can earn more money? So I messaged a friend who's, um, I mean, it says everything you need to know about it, that she used to work in bomb disposal in the army and she's now a firefighter. So um, she's similar to me, like she's just, She'll sign up to stupid shit without much thought. Anyway, I messaged her to say, do you reckon, you could, do you reckon one person could do 24 hours on a ski erg on their own? And within 10 minutes, she replied saying, I've Googled it. There's world records in men and women. Let's go. I'm like, great. We've got eight days. <laughs> so we were never going to create a level of fitness to become 24-hour endurance athletes in eight days. We were never going to be able to develop our physical fitness, our bodies, um, any any physical attribute was not, not going to be developed in eight days but what we both very quickly realized what we had to quickly develop was our mind we had to have a strategy we had to know how we were going to get it done what our markers were along the way we knew what the world record was but we knew what we needed to hit by every hour to be on course for that to give us a fighting chance for the final hour to hit the world records 
And then it was uh, tuning into, right, why are we doing this? What is the motivation and what are we doing? And um, on my ski erg, I had a picture of my daughter, um, a, a picture of Oscar, and then a poem that is basically around effort, intensity, and, and you control your actions and you control what you do. And then I had good people around me people that were in my ear throughout the whole 24 hours telling me that I was doing great, giving me a kick up the arse when I started to fatigue um, and looking after me. Now, it wasn't, so it, I guess the point I'm trying to make is very similar to the one with your marathon or half marathon, marathon that it's very rarely a physical limitation that we find ourselves that stops us achieving what we want to achieve. It is our mental capacity. It's our mental ability to get over that hurdle, to do that little bit extra, to do to do that action and that is the difference between even a, a good athlete and an elite athlete it's the ability to go that extra mile and for many very for many of the top athletes in the world like johnny wilkinson used to spend hours doing extra goal kicking that to him wasn't extra that was just training yeah but to a normal fly half that's extras but that's just the difference between mindset between a high performer and a good performer. And I guess the point I'm trying to make with all of these examples is this idea that our mind is the thing we need to control the most when it comes to any goal, whether it's stupid shit on a ski erg or a marathon, whether it's our body, whether it's our diets, whether it's our business career, relationships, friendships, that begins and ends with our ability to control our mind and ignore or reframe the feedback that our bodies are giving us. Yeah. Because our bodies and our minds are brilliant at providing feedback. Many of us don't listen to the feedback and we just try and close our ears and ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist. But you can only ignore pain for so long before it breaks you. So the, I personally think throughout all the stuff that I've done, my skill and ability to get it done is my ability to listen to the pain, process it, and then turn it into something else and then move forward into the next thing. And that isn't just necessarily physical pain. It's also stuff that's been said to me, about me, written about me, said behind my back, all these things. A lot of us like this idea of ignorance is bliss. But I'm like, no, cool, that's fine. I'll listen to it. I'll hear it. Mm -hmm. It's up to me how I process it, though. It's up to me whether I use it to motivate or demotivate. It's up to me whether I use it to light a fire or whether I allow it to knock me off my my journey. Um, And I guess it's this idea that feedback is good feedback but feedback is just data and it's up to us as the computer as to how we process that data and whether we turn that into a positive a negative a motivating force or a demotivating force and that starts and ends with us and that's the bit that so many of us struggle with is because no one else can control that that is our personal responsibility to ourselves to do the right thing with that information to mean that we make the right choices do the right things and see the goals that we want to achieve Oh, mate. I went a little bit deep on that one. <laughs> I, think, um, I think that's probably the best place to finish there. Um, I was going to follow up with, you know, what, what advice would you give to people <laughs> that you normally would give to your members or the general population and stuff like that. But, well, yeah, you got there before me. To be honest, though, on that, the, the biggest advice I can give, and it sounds the most cheesy and it's the easiest thing to say and the hardest thing to do, is just to do it. Mm. Like so, so many people look back on their lives, their careers, their sport, and oh, what if? Or oh, I could have done. Or maybe if I'd have done it a little bit different or I'd have done a bit more or I could have done it. But like, just try. Because at the end of the day, even if you fail, you will learn something about yourself. You'll learn something about the people around you. You'll learn something about your body. You might learn something that you are not. I might try an Ironman, fall apart halfway through and decide, actually, you know what? I am not an endurance athlete. So, but that for me, and I think that's what I covered on my vlog, is it's only a failure if we don't learn. So no matter what your goal is, even if you're that, for me, that, that, that fat kid that's never had abs, Mm-hmm. back yourself to get abs like if you want to do it do it just try because even if you don't you can still learn something but you only learn stuff if you're prepared to listen to that feedback to have some self-reflection self-inspection and then go again with what information that you've now learned 
Otherwise, it's that classic, if we always do what we've always done, we'll always get what we've always got. So if you continue to listen, if you continue to ignore and not listen to the lessons that, you're, you're, that life is teaching you, then you'll never progress in, in anything at the speed that you could if you actually did. So, yeah, I guess to add to that, my advice to anybody that's got a ridiculous goal, a stupid goal, or just something that everyone else around them thinks is impossible, like, just do it. And as long as you learn from it, then you'll be better for it. Yeah. I couldn't agree with you more. With that then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and with that, um, I suppose we'll cap an end to this uh, episode. No problem. Well, thank you very much for having me on. I hope I haven't waffled too much and uh, actually gave some constructive thought. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I really appreciate your time. You've gave up a hell of a lot of time uh, today, that's for sure. You know, whether you, you're on lockdown or not, um, it's really, really appreciated. That's for sure, John. No, anytime. No problem. Um, well, I will cut that as the end part. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> 